Hey everybody, in this episode of Trek in Time, we're going to be talking about Archer building bridges and then the pushback against those bridges being built leading to a coup. Why does that all sound so familiar? Yeah. Anyway, we're talking about <laughs> Star Trek. That's right. It's Enterprise Season 3, Episode 22, The Council. Welcome everybody to Trek in Time, where we're watching every episode of Star Trek in chronological order. We're also taking a look at what the world was like at the time of original broadcast. We're currently still in Enterprise, but we're in season three and we're right at the end of season three. We're three quarters of the way through, Matt. Can you believe it? I can I see the next series Shocking. from where I'm standing. That's right. Who are we? Well, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And with me is my brother, Matt. Matt is the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Matt, how are you doing on this fine Sunday? I am doing great. The weather is fantastic. It doesn't feel like fall. <laughs> Don't know what's going on, but it's great. How about you? My partner and I were out yesterday and stepped outside for a nice November jaunt about the city and discovered that it felt like it was mid August instead of mm -hmm. early November. And it was a little tricky navigating the city when you're dressed like it's November, but your body is saying, what the hell are you doing to me? So, <laughs> but we had a nice time. It is a lovely weekend and we hope everybody's enjoying their time as well. Before we get into the newest episode that we're going to be talking about, the council, Matt likes to share some comments from previous episodes. So Matt, what do you have from us, from our listeners? Well, there's quite a few comments. One from Skyfather. What show are you doing next? Is it restricted to Star Trek or you ever do something like Babylon 5? I had to bring that up because if we did Babylon 5, this show is going to take us probably like 60 years to complete because we're watching every show of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Babylon 5 would just be tacking on another decade on top of that. Yes. <laughs> But it's a great show. I yes, we are limited. To, oh. We are limited to Star Trek. But you know, if Matt and I both win the lottery and we decide we're done doing anything else, we're just going to talk about TV shows. Babylon Five would be a show I'd enjoy talking about. And I will say that if you subscribe to Trek and Time, become a, a supporter, and become an ensign, we do have a spinoff show just for supporters called Out of Time, where we talk about random pop culture things like we're going to be having one today where we're going to be talking about other tv shows like we talk about star wars star trek you, you name it mm -hmm. anything that's catching our eye we'll talk about it. so we maybe if there's something about babylon 5 we want to talk about it, we'll talk about it there like the reboot okay, so that the, is being done right now yeah i know so the, another comment was from robotrav he wrote this is on the episode 69 damage he said we, sean had asked I can't remember exactly how you phrased it, but you had made a comment mm -hmm. about like, this episode was kind of long. Do you think our episodes are too long, too short? Mm -hmm. What do you, how do you feel about that? And Robotrov answered, I agree that your episodes should be longer. I may have misunderstood the question. <laughs> and then directly related to that, King of 1337, putting an artificial time limit on your episode is a disservice to your audience. You should run an episode as long as it reasonably takes. If one episode's 20 minutes and another is an hour, that's perfectly acceptable. Keep up the good work. So I just kind of, we got some feedback to your question that you put mm -hmm. out to the audience. I'm in the camp of the episodes are as long as they need to be. We'll, we'll talk <laughs> as long as we think there's something to talk about. And we're not going to say every episode's an hour. We're not going to say every episode's 20 minutes. Yeah. It takes what it takes. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's helpful guidance, especially considering when we first started doing these, it felt like it was 90 minutes, but it was largely because yeah. of inefficiencies of never having done it before. And as we've moved yeah. forward, we've gotten more efficient. So thank you everybody for weighing in on that. And directly related to the episode uh, of damage, uh, Jeff Halverson, I <laughs> just butchered your name. This episode really bothered me. You saw no hint that Archer struggled with the decision and is not, was not in character for him. I believe this was a problem in Scott Bakula's acting and the writing. Additionally, they had no consequences, which I found to be particularly egregious. Archer should be court-martialed. Um, yeah, this was some... about the one where he made the decision, that tough decision to um, basically rob that ship. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we had some, we had some yeah. disagreement in our discussion on that one where I think I was a little yeah. more like this kind of doesn't fit within what we understand these characters to be. And I would have appreciated yeah. a little bit more in the writing to kind of like show us how they were forced into a decision that really stood out as being problematic. Yep. 
But as for today's episode, we're going to get into that in a minute. And as you could tell from the sound, that's probably a little bit louder than my voice. That's the read alert. It means it's time for Matt to tackle the Wikipedia description. And Matt, I will give you a heads up. It feels a little bit like as we've moved into these better episodes, there are yeah. some, there's a little more effort put into the descriptions of some of these episodes. So I don't <laughs> think you're going to find yourself quite in the weeds the way you have in previous episodes. That's great. Set in the 22nd century, the series follows the adventures of the first Starfleet Starship Enterprise registration NX-01. Season three of Enterprise features an ongoing story following an attack on Earth by previously unknown aliens called the Zindi. In this episode, Captain Jonathan Archer, Scott Bakula, attempts to convince the Zindi Council not to use their super weapon on Earth. Meanwhile, Subcommander T'Pol, Jolene Blaylock, leads an away team to a nearby sphere to attempt to retrieve a data core in order to get more information on the sphere builders. That's a very good description. That is a pretty succinct yes. take on the episode. This episode, season three, episode 22, directed by David Livingston. This is his fourth directorial turn this season. Episode written by Manny Cotto, and this is his fifth episode written this season. It originally aired on May 12th, 2004, and guest appearances include Randy Oglesby, again as Degra, Tucker Smallwood, again as the Zindi Primate Counselor, Rick Worthy, again as Jannar, Scott McDonald, again as Commander Dolem, Josette DiCarlo as the Sphere Bu Builder Woman, Sean McGowan as Corporal Hawkins, Mary Mara as the Sphere Builder Presage, and Ruth Williamson as the Sphere Builder Primary. There are various, they look very much like different versions of the same person, but it's... Yep. Uh, very subtle differences and it's, and it's basically just, you can recognize the difference via voice. It's a little distracting at one point when what looks like three versions of the same person are talking to each other. And it's a little hard <laughs> yeah. to tell even intentionally when they are or where they are, because it is a completely white background. So it is this sort of heaven like discussion of, <laughs> we have to do things because things aren't happening the way we want them to happen. And those are the three actresses who are well, playing those parts. I thought they were going to start to introduce the next iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, if at any sudden moment it had turned to a colored background and all we could see were earbuds, then that would have been your <laughs> clue. As I mentioned, the original air date of this May 12th, 2004, what was the world like at the time of this broadcast? Well, Matt, I don't think you'll forget that you were singing along to Maroon five, this love, Mm. You no, know, that was the, mm -hmm. that was the song that spurred you on to get your first back tech too. So, <laughs> and in the movie theater, people were lining up to see Van Helsing. And I don't know why $51 million in its opening weekend for Hugh Jackman, Kate Beckinsale in a movie that largely forgettable, forgettable and is available on Peacock in case you don't want to forget about it. And on television, on this day, May 12th, 2004, what were we watching? Well, once again, not really watching Enterprise, although the numbers were up a little bit. And that was one of the things that popped out in my research is somebody said the good news for Enterprise at this point was that the viewership was up. Well, the viewership was up to 3.2 million. So that's really looking at a silver lining of a pretty dark cloud. Smallville and WB yep. was getting 4.5 million. NBC's special on The Mentalist. Ooh, remember that show? 6.2 <laughs> million. That 70s show was earning 11.5 million. 60 Minutes 2 was getting 9.8. And My Wife and Kids was airing back to back episodes, getting about 8.7 million per episode. And to give you a sense of, you know, we've talked about in previous episodes the change in television from the broadcast commercial model to what we have now, which is, is called the prestige version where it's a lot more subscription based. And we now have the reemergence of commercial television, but it's slightly modified in the form of either an app that has commercials still embedded in it or free services like Tubi and Pluto, where you can get some programming and commercials are embedded in it but to give you a sense of how pairings of shows really does work or does not work to lead 
to a block of programming that consistently brings people in. You want shows that don't necessarily have to be directly related, but can kind of be a part of the same conversation with the viewers so that you end up with something yeah. like what happened on WB, Smallville leading into Angel. Angel got about 4 million viewers. So you end up with these two shows that are both going to appeal to the very s- same audience. Uh, obviously, NBC is using its block of programming for its main primetime shows leading into the West Wing, one of the strongest and most critically acclaimed shows on television at the time. That 70s show was leading directly into American Idol. And you end up with sitcoms like My Wife and Kids leading directly into The Bachelor. So it's you you want your programming to kind of be of a theme, even if it's not all of the same thread. What were they doing on UPN? Well, Star Trek Enterprise was leading into America's Next Top Model. At its finest. Programming at its <laughs> finest. This is a little bit like taking two very different balls of mud and throwing them both at the wall to see which one sticks. America's Next Top Model. Amer- Let me say that again because I said the wrong word. America's Next Top Model was getting viewership <laughs> of about 1.4 million. It was not retaining Star Trek Enterprise's fan base no surprise but it was also not a show that would have brought people to upn an hour earlier in anticipation of getting to that show so there's no crossover there's no crossover (laughs) there's no appeal for like somebody to tune in at eight o'clock and stay until 10 it is you're showing up for enterprise or not and then you're showing up for america's next top model or not but that kind of synergy does not help either program. And so that's what we're seeing here, I think. And what was going on in the world at large? Well, the United States right around this time in May announced that the U S department of energy would be building the world's fastest supercomputer capable of sustained performance of 50 trillion calculations per second compared to the 36.5 trillion for Japan's earth simulator and less than 8 trillion for the U.S.'s ASC White computer. The computer to be federally funded to the tune of 50 million will be built at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And where does that fit in the big picture, Matt? I'm sure you're wondering. Frontier is the name of the current fastest supercomputer. It is at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The machine was built at a cost of 600 million, so more than 10 times the previous Department of Energy computer cost. It began deployment in 2021 and reached full capability in 2022. It clocks 1.1 exaflops. What is an exaflop, you're asking? I do not know, but it is a lot more than the 50 trillion calculations per second of the computer that was proposed 20 years ago. Computer technology, the evolution and the expansion of it is exponential in nature. So it is no surprise that the bold broadcast in 2004 of we're going to build the world's best supercomputer now looks archaic in comparison to what we're building now. (laughs) Also around this time in May in 2004, the Mexican air force released a video of 11 UFOs that they had filmed over the state of Campeche. And there was debate about what the source of this was with some people saying it was just pockets of atmospheric gas and on the war on terrorism al qaeda a manual was found at one al qaeda raid site which listed basic instructions for al qaeda members regarding the hierarchy of terrorism targets first target u.s citizens followed by britons spaniards and then australians now on to the current episode in discussion This is the council and this episode, unlike most of the previous ones actually has a date attached to it. It is February 12th, 2154. It's nice to be reintroduced to what the calendar is supposed to be within the show. So at this point, the enterprise has been jetting around the galaxy for roughly three years. If we can recall the original date of launch. So yep. we find ourselves in the, the meeting that Degra and Archer were trying to make happen. The cause of the previous episode where 
We ended up with time loops and all sorts of shenanigans around how can we make sure the future happens the way the past said it should. And while that episode didn't have quite the same gravitas and maybe footing underneath it as the previous episodes, this one feels like a return to that more solid ground. I almost feel like you could remove E squared from the viewing timeline and you really wouldn't miss all that much in the big picture context. You would lose the nice character development moments around to Paul and her experience with incorporation of emotions and, and giving advice to herself and really saying like, reach out to the people around you. These are, these are the people you care about. You should reach out to them. But as far as the big picture, the Zindi storyline, you can really kind of remove that one from the viewing and, and step right into this episode. What did you think about this one, Matt? No, it was the same thing. It's like the last episode you could have skipped and gone right to this one because it's so clearly tied to what had been happening before. Overall, I really like this one a lot. I thought it was very enjoyable. A couple of little things that were throwing me off, one of which was the wonky eyes. <laughs> it's such a, the little contact lenses and the extreme close-ups of the reptilians mm -hmm. and one eye being like slightly rotated like this. Yes. <laughs> Dolan's eyes are just, a little like, off, but if yeah. you, but if you just so pretend he's part chameleon. Minor technical details, I, I liked it. I thought it was a very good episode. Yeah, I agree. It has within it, the, the Zindi Council's scenes to me stand out as the most important within the episode. Mm -hmm. Because as opposed to what we're accustomed to on Enterprise, you're not going to end up on Enterprise with a lot of drastic difference of opinion regarding what the plan is. Everybody is on board with, here's what our goal is. We're trying to form peace. We're not going in to blow up their weapon anymore. We're trying to really find a peaceful solution here. So what we're seeing is the emergence of what would be in the original series and next generation. We're seeing the, the, the building blocks of peaceful solution should be our primary goal mm -hmm. as opposed to the way the season started, which was we need to go do whatever it takes in order to stop this thing, including just full blown war. So there's an evolution there. Meanwhile, on the Zindi council side, it's the opposite. There's more drama on the Zindi council side, simply because you have them splintering and the arguments between them, Degra giving, I love the sequence of Archer and Degra talking about what should you anticipate when you get in front of the council. And the little glimpses of all the different Zindi types and saying, well, you know us and you've got the, the arboreals and here's the aquatics who are going to be, it's going to take some effort to get them. They're reasonable, but it takes them forever to make a decision. And then there's the insectoids and the, the reptilians, and they are probably going to be impossible to convince. So that little, sh you know, set of shots of these different things, including giving a name to the aquatic, which I thought was a nice little touch. Like she's very reasonable, but sh do not expect her to make any fast decisions, but really I, kind of like focus on her. I might be alone in this, but that sequence, I actually noted that it irritated me just a little bit. It felt a little too much, like too much of an exposition dump. It didn't feel as organic as it probably could have been super minor nitpick i did yeah. enjoy the fact that they were giving this but at the same time it was like yeah we already picked up on the subtext of what you're talking about if you've been watching all the episodes up until now but it felt like well they had to put this in here just in case somebody hadn't been watching all along so it felt like they kind of had to do it the way they did it yeah i get it but at the same time it was kind of like yeah you didn't yeah you've already kind of half said this stuff and reading between the lines and previous episodes i already picked that up so why are you talking about it now that was the only part, but I did like the fact that they gave names to some of these people yeah. that we've been seeing that we hadn't heard before. And like also the, the name of the uh, insectoid, which was like their names get longer. The, as they get <laughs> the older, older, yeah. get older. I, I, those little nuances were kind of fun. So it's like, there was enjoyment out of it. I got, but at the same time, it felt a little exposition heavy. I, I agree. There was exposition there. And I agree that the cause of it was probably to make sure that anybody who joined the episode without yeah. having seen previous stuff was up to speed. 
but I do think that they did figure out a, a, enough of a balance for me to it's make clever. it feel like Degra doesn't know what Archer knows about these different species. So he's like yep. giving him that like, okay, here's what, the, who's this one? She, or she actually has a name. And then there's this one. I'd tell you his name, but it would take me too long. So like little insights into that, I think balanced out the overall, Hey viewers, maybe you remember yeah. from these previous episodes, literal yeah. shots from previous episodes, but we really get to see Dolom in this one as more than just a heavy. Mm -hmm. I feel like we get to see a little bit of the motivation that works from the sphere builders, which is you don't have to stand by and watch other members of the Zindi council give away your safety. And he really does see himself. This is, this is key in good storytelling. Your villain has to believe that they are right. Yep. Your villain has to believe that they have good reasons. They have to see themselves as the hero of their story. And this is a case of in the early days of enterprise, it always felt like, like the Suliban were introduced without there being, you never got the sense that any Suliban actually believed in what they were doing. No, it always felt a little bit like, well, if I had a mustache, you would see me twirling it. It's not <laughs> quite sold in the way that this is where Dolem has the conversation with the severe builder who says unequivocally, you could be the hero of your people. You are, you are not, you do not need to stand by and that he takes that and uses that in his argument with Degra, I think is very important to the story that he's standing there in front of Degra and saying, your name will be a, a, you will be viewed as a villain in our history. I will make sure that your bloodline ends with you. There's no doubt in my mind that you are a traitor to your people. And I will not stand by and let that happen. It's a very, very Shakespearean story in this episode. Whereas the previous ones have felt a little more plot based in the form of the mechanics of like, well, how do we get from point A to point B? How do we make sure that we escape safely into this other terrain so that we can get to that meeting? Yep. This one feels more evocative to me of some of the Klingon storylines from next generation in the kind of like blade sharpening machinations, getting into somebody's chamber and then just letting them know what they really think about the other person before they stab them. This is, this is a more Shakespearean drama. Yeah. The one thing I was, I, I will agree with you. It's good storytelling on this. I love that. That scene was great of, it was very menacing. Yeah. When he came into Degra's chamber, you knew, oh, something bad's going to happen here. It's all done with shadow. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. The, my one complaint though is while it's good storytelling for this specific episode, if this comes back to the unevenness of the show at large, it's like, if this was your end point, why were you not building some of these characters out a little bit more earlier on? Because up until this point, the reptilians have been that mustache twirling. Yeah. We're just evil. Ah! And it was like, there was never any kind of backstory until this episode. You could have been planting the seeds of what what was this head reptilian's name? I can't remember his name. Dolem. Dolem. Commander Dolem. You could have been setting up Dolem's character like weeks ago like many, many weeks ago about like giving little hints as to why he is the way he is, the, his line of thinking of how he thinks he might be able to do better at leading the council than the council itself. You could have been dropping these nuggets of information in a more coherent way than just like a kind of a massive dump of information in this one. I enjoyed it, but I yeah. just felt like, oh, you had a missed opportunity. You could have been building up some of these villains earlier on. I agree. Did you there feel was... the same way? Yeah, I agree. There's, there are moments where I found myself thinking you've used Dolem in multiple episodes, but there yeah. were episodes where you didn't use Dolem that could have really benefited this long-term storytelling that you're talking about. Like yep. the episode where the reptilians were back in earth's past conducting an attempt to create a, a bioweapon to destroy humans before they would ever get even close to being a threat to the Zindi. And I found myself thinking like they 
could have done something before that or after that with Dolom talking about that plan. Like, mm-hmm. like, and if it was done in the form of him saying, I hate having to use this kind of subterfuge, but what we're trying to accomplish here is too important. We're talking about the safety of our people. Like yep. a simple line like that can go a long way. And there's been a number of episodes in the council where, as you mentioned, he is largely just being intransigent and mustache twirling instead of making coherent arguments around this is about our people's safety. We're, and yep. and and if there was more credence given not only to Dolem but to the insectoids, I would have liked it if the insectoids made some arguments as well in the form of we've been scrambling for a safe territory and we feel like we're on the verge of finding a new home world and like we need to stay united from that perspective it would have been interesting for the insectoids to be making those arguments and i also like the idea that they've built into the personality types there's the humanoids there's the arboreals the arboreals are a little more methodic a little more detached and it's it feels literally lifted out of, well, what's the personality type of this type of creature? So arboreals sloth, like maybe a little more like, Oh, kind of moving at my own pace, moving at my own time. Then the aquatics are moving at a completely other scale of speed born of the the style of communication. At one point in this episode, it's really nice that Hoshi refers to there's a, point where they use sonar for the past tense like little nuances like that that are fascinating it would have been nice to see that for the reptilians and the insectoids as well because the ones that seem to be potential allies feel more fleshed out whereas the ones that are viewed as villains are less so and it would have been nice to see there being a little bit more argument like what kind of argument does an insectoid make about community and family what type of statement do they make about how they do they envision all Zindi as part of a hive, that kind of thing. Are we a nest? Like, is there an importance to the episode where the insectoid hatchlings are discovered and the hatchlings use a chemical to basically create reverse imprinting? Yep. How does that manifest as a philosophy within the adult insectoids? I'd be interested in that kind of argument coming from them saying if we like if an insectoid were to say to the council, if we can't make the humans part of us, then they need to be rejected. They need to be destroyed. It's as simple as that. And this episode finally does that with reptilians. When Dolom is confronting Degra, one of the best parts of that conversation is they are in the they're basically in the homes of the avian Zindi and Dolom looks out a window and says, I've always hated it here because it's too exposed. Yeah. We prefer to be on the ground where we can see what's coming. And it's the first moment that you're like, there's also their personality manifested from like, what is an instinctive reptilian approach to safety versus where they are. And I thought and that that was, it was nice. Yeah. The, the, the stench of failure. He says it's, it reeks of failure. It's like, there's the whole, we're strong. We can take care of ourselves. And and that kind of ties into one of the things I wanted to bring up about the whole council arguments that they make when the evidence is being shown and how the reptilians keep saying, oh, that's manufactured. That's fake. Mm-hmm. You know, there is a whole, <laughs> I know we're talking about Trek in time in context for when the show was made, but it felt so present to now it was uncanny yeah. of if something doesn't fit your belief and your narrative, it has to be fake. Yeah. Fake news. And it was fascinating to me how it, tr- it was, it was felt like it was written today, mm-hmm. but clearly the writers are, you know, playing on human tropes that have been around for thousands of years and they're just playing looking at history the, about yeah. how, how democracies fall and yeah. how things fall apart they're writing that into the story because it's happened again and again and again. And we're in a moment right now where the strong man argument is front and center right now in our politics around the world. And so it was interesting to see the strong man arguments playing out in this episode. 
So I, 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 <laughs> I loved it. I loved it for that, that reason of if there was one episode I was going to pick from this season to tell people, hey, everybody, you should probably watch this episode. It would be this specific one because it feels so current. To me. Yeah. It also fits in with within the context of 2004. Yeah. This is following on the heels of, hey, everybody, we got to go into Iraq because they're building weapons of mass destruction. Yep. And then here we are in 2004. No weapons were found, would ever be found. And this would be part of the major push from the Democrats in their campaign with John Kerry as their candidate to remove George W. Bush from office, effectively saying he was wrong. He was, they made up stuff in order to be able to go in and do what they wanted to do. Yep. So this was on everybody's, this is on everybody's radar at the point. And I don't disagree that it is evergreen as a topic. Mm -hmm. It has resurfaced again in whatever, you know, 18 year cycle we appear to be in of, <laughs> if you don't agree with it, it's faked. And the and only I can solve this problem. Yes. It's that, that mentality that yeah. is the strong man argument. And it is from Dolan's perspective, it is one other element of this that I really would have appreciated. We just talked about, wouldn't it have been nice if Dolan had been revealing a little bit more of his positive motivations in the past? I would appreciate more in this episode if he revealed a little bit more of, does he actually think that the sphere builders are being honest or does he right. see there is an opportunity for his people, his specific group of people to take the top seat? Because I think it's more compelling if he does all of this reluctantly, then you have a Macbeth character. Like, I don't want to have to do this thing, but I got these people telling me that if I don't do this, that all Zindi are going to be destroyed. So therefore I have to do this terrible thing in order to do this. I wish there had maybe been a little more reluctance in his actions because mm -hmm. what they put on the screen is a little bit of, as you just mentioned, him saying fake news about all of the evidence and then being told, well, if you don't do this, your people will all die. So he acts, but it's unclear. Does he fully trust the sphere builders or is he just, yeah, they're telling the me situation. what I want to hear. So it's like, yeah. I, I feel like there's a little bit of a nuance that isn't clear enough in what his motivation is. And I think that there's a lot of room for, the drama of it could have been um, turned up a notch depending on picking one path over the other. There's a certain amount of drama that could absolutely come out of him being like, yeah, I know she's lying to me, but I like what she's saying. And then there's another one, which is woe is me. I have to take this blade and I have to stick it to your chest. And the death scene for me for Degra was a heartbreaking one because I kept yes, thinking I kept running into future headcanon of how will Degra be spoken of in the history books of the Federation? Like right. that future that we know is coming because we know those shows. What does Picard know of Degra? What does Picard know of the discussions between Archer and Degra and how to form a piece? And I kept thinking, this is the kind of thing that would be taught at the Academy. This is the kind of thing that members of Starfleet as they're going through the Academy would be taught, like, how did Archer do this? What was the turning point for building a piece instead of just going after the weapon? And how did he do it? What was the connection? Right. And I kept thinking, you know, part of me was going back again and again to, well, if Archer is the old, old West, Kirk is the old West. And right. And <laughs> thinking of Kirk and his approach to like, all those overacted moments of, I know what you're going through. When he would say to aliens, I know what you're going through because we went through this on earth. Like he's constantly throwing that out as like, Hey, empathy. Hey, I understand. Hey, I get it. You know, like all of that feels at work in that scene with Degra when he's being murdered and being told you will be forgotten. And I kept thinking, no, no, you're not. No, he's not. This is, <laughs> this is a moment where, he will be talked about as, as this man who saw the opportunity for peace and was murdered for it, but ultimately had done enough to help well, bridge that gap. 
it, it, it ties right into this another scene that I wanted to call out, which was between Trip and Degra. There was a couple scenes between the two of them where Trip was continuing his passive aggression yeah. towards Degra. And I love that Degra finally stood up to him and called him out on it and said, listen, I am risking my life and my family's life because I know this is right. He basically cut me some slack here. It's like, you don't have to forgive me for what I did, but understand I am risking my life for this. And I thought that was a really beautiful scene and it was a great chance for Trip to kind of start to turn that corner of like, well, oh crap. Yeah, you're yeah. right. And so it's leading into that, you know, in history, like for the Federation, for the P Picard time, you know that Degra would be some kind of talked about as a man who gave his life to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So you know he's probably revered in that in that way. Meanwhile, we haven't even touched on the no. shuttle pod. <laughs> yeah. Which is off collecting data from inside a sphere, which includes a very, very minor moment, but I thought it was a nicely constructed touching moment where you see Reed invite one of the Makos to join them. <laughs> can I, can I just come yes. Back? This, that whole scene to me was so tragic because yeah. he's inviting this guy and you're talking to him and I'm thinking you should be wearing a red shirt yeah, right yeah. now because you're going to die. That's just what I was going to say is we make a joke <laughs> out of the read alert. This is also should have yeah. been his read shirt. It was, Hey, yeah. Hey, you know how to use an exosuit, right? Well, why don't you come along? Oh, and here's this red shirt I made for you. You could put that on. <laughs> it's yeah you know that the guy's gonna die but the way th the purpose behind his death doesn't feel like an original trek where it'd be like we beam down to the planet and oh my god that guy's dead it was yeah. it was they have a role for him there's a logical reason for him to be there he is defending the team from something that is obviously a threat and he gives his life in his attempt to defend them and then ultimately the biggest part of the payoff is you see Reed have a breakdown on the shuttle. He freaks out and he's just like, he's, he's wrestling with the idea of acceptable losses. I thought that was a very touching and very important moment for Reed's character. Yeah. I really like that. Yeah. Especially when he's saying acceptable losses is 20%, 20%. Yeah. We've blown past that. Yeah. And it's just like him having enough. It's like enough is enough. He doesn't yeah. want to lose one more person, which I yeah. thought was, it was really nice for him. And I wrote in my notes, all I wrote was when he died, I wrote red shirt, exclamation mark, all that EV training for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Not only EV training, but EV combat training. It was just like the whole thing. It was like, you're the perfect guy for this job. Oops. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and then ultimately the reason that they go to the sphere is to collect data modules from the sphere. And then there's no payoff within this episode for it. They are limping back to the enterprise because the shuttlecraft is damaged by transitioning through the spheres protective barrier. They're still functioning. They're going to make it back, but then all hell breaks loose because the reptilians and insectoids managed to steal the weapon, get it off of the building uh, platform and into space. And they get it to a warp corridor where it disappears with all the other Zindi and the Enterprise chasing after it, trying to stop it. And at this point now, there's a full fracturing. There's an, it is effectively the first stages of a coup and civil war where yep. all the other Zindi, other than the Insectoids and Reptilians, are now fully firing upon other Zindi in an attempt to stop them. You see the Enterprise as a part of this, I love that there is just the briefest of the shuttlecraft is kind of calling to us and Archer is like, tell them to wait here. Yeah, <laughs> we'll be we'll back. Be back. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come and get them. And it's just like, what? Like I could only imagine how upset, uh, to Paul and Reed might be when they, and Mayweather, when they get the signal back from the enterprise of we'll be back and see everybody disappear into warp. And they're like, we're just here in Zindi space with this planet full of Zindi <laughs> who don't know that there was a coup. So how safe are we? Yeah. This episode, and we've had a number of episodes that we've, we've talked about recently where one ties directly into another. 
one leads right into the next and you see that cohesive storyline. But this one was the first one where as I was watching it, I actively thought, I don't want to not watch the next one. I had the same thing. I, I was just like, I need to keep, and I was I like, need to keep watching. I just go ahead and watch the next yeah. one right now? <laughs> and I knew there was nothing stopping me from doing that, but I really felt like compelled to like, holy cow, this is, this is pretty gripping. I want to get to, yeah, I want to get to the end. Like, and in looking at the upcoming episodes, I noticed that the dates that they give for the episodes are like literally the same day. So the next couple of episodes effectively do follow one on top of the next. So I'm really looking yep. forward to getting to those. So before we get into the next episode, which is going to be countdown. And as I mentioned, the, the star date of this one, there are no star dates yet, but it's February 13th, 2154 with the final episode zero hour hitting on February 14th, 2154 Valentine's day. No. There's, it feels like it's, it feels almost like it's worth looking at them as part of the whole, but we are still going to be treating them as individual episodes just to let everybody know. So don't rush through watching them. If you don't want to sustain that cliffhanger momentum or lack of momentum, I guess. <laughs> and in the meantime, let us know what you thought about this episode. You could drop a comment beneath this YouTube video, but if you're listening to this as a podcast via Apple, Google, or Spotify, wherever it was, you picked it up, go back there and leave a comment there, leave a review, reach out to us through the contact information in the podcast description. Let us know what you thought about it. Matt, what do you have coming up on your next episode? Um, it was a very Star trek -y topic, nuclear fusion. I've talked to a bunch of nuclear fusion companies that are startups that have some really cool tech that's bringing fusion to market much faster than you might think is possible. It's a really interesting subject. I like touching on every once in a while. Mm. As for me, as usual, you can always go to my website, seanfarrell.com, or you can just go to wherever it is that you find your books. That includes everything from Amazon to your local bookstore to your public library. You can find my books at all those locations. And I've got books for young readers in the form of picture books. I've got stuff for adults like sci-fi novel, Man in the Empty Suit, which is about a time traveler who may in fact have murdered himself. So those are all available for you please check them out. And if you'd like to support the show, please consider reviewing us on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever it was you found this. And if you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show, click on the become a supporter button. It allows you to not only throw coins at our heads and leave disgusting welts, but you also become an ensign. What does that mean? Well, you will automatically be subscribed to our spinoff show out of time. It will start showing up in your feed and what do you get on out of time? Well, you get all the things that we won't talk about in Trek in time. In other words, anything we will talk about yep. some other Star Trek shows. <laughs> We've previously talked about things like lower decks and strange new worlds. We will talk about things like the star Wars program and, or which is what we're going to record in just a few minutes for this upcoming episode of out of time. We'll also talk about movies like the two movies I want to talk about today. Watcher, and barbarian so we hope you'll join us there by becoming a direct supporter thank you so much for listening or watching and we'll talk to you next time mm -hmm.